Welcome everyone to NAVA 55's virtual tour. This year's tour takes us to the U.S. Coast Guard's Exhibit Center, the repository for the service's Heritage Asset Collection. Located in Maryland, the center houses the offices of the Coast Guard Collections Manager and the Curator, as well as the objects and artifacts not on exhibit at the Coast Guard Academy's museum or on loan across the country. My name is Janet Pashuk. I'm the Collections Manager for the Coast Guard Heritage Asset Collection. We are currently at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center, which is a 12,800 square foot warehouse where we store all of our, well, not all of our heritage assets, the majority of them are stored here and preserved here in this facility. Artifacts that we have here at the Exhibit Center include all types of navigational equipment. We have aeronautical equipment. We have also uh, uniforms, medals, a few small boats, weapons, and firearms. Just a huge variety of items. Uh, this here is a Fresnel lens. Fresnel lenses are probably some of our more spectacular and rare artifacts in the Coast Guard Heritage Asset Collection. The way the glass was cut helped light, uh, the light that would be inside refract very long distances. And so these were put in the tops of lighthouses. They're very valuable. And um, yeah, I'd prefer not to let you actually talk about how, uh, how much they're worth, but um, you could probably do some Googling online to figure that out, but they're very valuable. We have also a Viet Cong boat here. The Coast Guard um, did serve in Vietnam. Name boards. We have a huge collection of these, which just show the name of the, the cutter and would have been displayed on the cutter while it was in service. This is the bell from the light ship Nantucket, um, which was a light ship that uh, served to um, get mariners to safety and avoid dangers of the Nantucket Shoals back in uh, from about 19, 10 to 1934 when the light ship Nantucket was hit by um, the sister ship to the Titanic which was called the Olympic. There were uh, 11 aboard the light ship Nantucket when it was hit by the Olympic. Um, seven of those people perished and the ship was lost to the sea. We're in the uh, Coast Guard Exhibit Center's art storage room. And this is the area where we uh, preserve and house our heritage art, but we also have another collection, which is called the Coast Guard Art Program. Uh, for short, it's called COGAP, C-O-G-A-P. Uh, many of these paintings um, are juried annually uh, and then put on exhibit in a gallery in New York City. And a lot of these are available um, digitized online. So if you were to look up Coast Guard Art Program, um, you could find links to see many of the, the paintings that are in that collection as well. This is a, a painting by Anton Otto Fischer. He's one of the more famous artists that we have in our World War II combat art collection here at, at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center. Anton Otto Fischer was actually a fairly famous illustrator back in the 1930s and into the 1940s. He had done many illustrations for Life magazine and other publications of that era. His, his artwork was famous enough that uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard at the time, Admiral Weishi, asked if he would come aboard and serve with the U.S. Coast Guard during World War II to capture action that the Coast Guard was participating in. This particular painting is called Firing Depth Charges. It's a nighttime scene where depth charges are fired from a Y-gun from the deck of a merchant ship to fight off a German submarine. Since the merchant ship is very slow, the charges must be set to explode deep enough to allow the ship to escape the blast. Thank you to Janet for taking time away from all her regular duties to provide us a personalized inside look at the wide variety of objects in the Coast Guard's collection. And speaking of the collection, Janet has pulled four different historical flags from storage at the Exhibit Center specifically for this annual NAVA meeting. The first of the flags is distinctively Coast Guard. 
Here set out for us is the ensign and commissioning pennant from the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Grand Isle. Hull number 1338 and named after Grand Isle, Louisiana. It was home ported in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Grand Isle was an island class patrol boat of 110 feet and powered by its twin diesel engines it was capable of almost 30 knots. It was commissioned in 1991 at a cost of just shy of $6 million. Armed with a Mark 38 25mm machine gun forward as well as smaller caliber machine guns, it was a capable cutter. After 24 years of service and when no longer fitting the Coast Guard's needs, it was decommissioned and transferred to the Pakistan Navy's Maritime Security Agency in 2016. The same year it was commissioned, it was part of a Coast Guard operation that confiscated about $800 million worth of cocaine from a fishing boat off the coast of Long Island, New York. According to one of its crew members on board at the time, the drugs were allegedly part of the Gambino crime family and Panama dictator Manuel Noriega were trying to bring into the U.S. He said, quote, They had a mothership that came up to New York to unload a fishing boat. We caught the fishing boat, and then the Reliant, another cutter, went out and caught the mothership. So we got the whole mother load, you might say, unquote. The cutter also participated in dozens of operations involving other interdictions aimed at illegal drugs. Search and rescue missions to include the tragic crash of TWA Flight 800 off the coast of Long Island in the summer of 1996, and the patrolling of New York Harbor after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Its wartime service included international deployments during the subsequent war in Iraq. One of the cutter's most notable involvements is its claim to be the first of its class of cutters to cross the Atlantic. In this frame presentation piece, you see a U.S. Coast Guard ensign and its commissioning pennant flown on the Grand Isle during its 2000 deployment on the other side of the Atlantic, where it was part of Atlantic Area Command's Patrol Forces Mediterranean. Its mission morphed during its short time in the Med, but started as one of the cutters cutting off a waterborne escape route for Iraqi leaders fleeing through Syria and into the Mediterranean. When Syria agreed to close its borders, the cutters involved in the operation were released and returned to the U.S. Our second historic flag on display is the United States national flag from the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Point Slocum, hull number 82313. The Point-class cutters were 82-foot steel-hulled vessels built starting in 1960 to replace earlier wooden-hulled cutters. 79 were eventually commissioned, with many in U.S. service for about 30 years. The design of the vessel focused on reducing crew size, and thus the Point-class cutters had an eight-man crew with space for up to 13 for wartime service. Twin diesel engines gave the cutter an 18-knot top speed and an air-conditioned interior proved very popular when 26 of the cutters were sent to Vietnam to execute Operation Market Time during the war. All cutters sent to Vietnam were eventually decommissioned and turned over to the Republic of Vietnam. The Point Slocum was commissioned in 1961 and was originally home ported in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In 1965, she was made part of Coast Guard Squadron 1 to support Operation Market Time. Interestingly, the Point Slocum was not sailed to Asia, but loaded onto a merchant ship for transport to the Philippines to be refitted for war service. The refit included adding four 50 caliber machine guns and having its 20 millimeter cannon replaced by an over-under 50 caliber machine gun and trigger-fired 81 millimeter mortar combination. The unique machine gun mortar combination was specifically designed for service in Vietnam. The Point Slocum arrived in Vietnam in early 1966 and was assigned to Division 13 of Squadron 1 quickly assuming its duties of boarding Vietnamese junks and other boats to identify people on board and to search for illegal weapons and other contraband. The flag you see on display was flying aboard Point Slocum in an armed action on 20 June 1966. That day, Cutters Point League and Point Slocum, along with Point Hudson, assisted with the capture of a 125-foot People's Republic of China trawler loaded with tons of weapons and ammunition near the mouth of the Cochian River in South Vietnam. After the trawler was engaged by a cutter and eventually run aground, she caught fire, and two U.S. Navy vessels provided firefighting teams assisted by Point League and Point Slocum. Both cutters pulled alongside the burning trawler and directed fire hoses on the cargo holds full of ammunition. The crews of the cutters not only had to battle the fire on the trawler, but also the enemy aboard the trawler and along the shore, likely those expecting to unload the trawler. The Coast Guardsmen were eventually supported by helicopter gunships suppressing fire from the enemy shoreline. The flag was recently donated to the Heritage Asset Collection by one of the 50 caliber machine gunners serving on the Point Slocum. You can observe the battle damage in the field of the flag from shrapnel or flying debris from hostile fire both from the trawler and from enemy personnel on shore. The action lasted three to four hours and important intelligence along with about 250 tons of military stores on board were eventually able to be retrieved from the trawler. 
the commanding officer of the Point Slocum was awarded a rare for the Coast Guard, Silver Star Medal, as was a Bronze Star Medal with Combat Valor Device awarded to a Chief Petty Officer and Engineman on the crew. Moving to the third of our four flags is an example of the breadth of flag types in the Coast Guard's Heritage Asset Collection. This is a Viet Cong flag or the flag of the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam. This now unused flag type, adopted in 1960, is said to be a variation on the flag of Communist North Vietnam, which is essentially a red field with a yellow five-pointed star in its center. The blue bottom half of a Viet Cong flag purportedly represents control over the capitalist South, and as with the red top half, the blue comes in a variety of shades. This one has a fairly dark blue shade to its bottom half. Other examples range from much darker shades of blue to an almost sky or baby blue. The outline of the five-pointed star is most often rendered with straight lines, with others having somewhat rounded arms, giving a bit of a 3D effect. This example has a star with straight sides. Most of these flags appear to be constructed with the more common point-up orientation of the central star. As you may observe, this example is a variant, with the star oriented with one point towards the hoist, a much less common orientation but not unique. Further, the star is only visible on the obverse. No attempt appears to have been made to cut the fabric away in the reverse to allow the star to show through. Measuring overall about 31 inches by 35 inches, the flag is sewn from a very lightweight cotton cloth with its red top half somewhat faded to an odd light orange shade or pinkish hue. The top half is straight stitch sewn to its blue bottom half, and appliqued in the middle of the combined field is a yellow star. The field has been folded over to form a very narrow sleeve at the hoist, which allows it to be mounted to a thin staff or hung from a line. Some observers have posited this may be a banner vice a flag, its star being visible only on the obverse and oriented towards the hoist, along with its very narrow sleeve support that theory. It is machine stitched versus hand sewn, so likely not hastily fabricated in the field or made by a member of a unit. Despite the fading to the field and some physical damage, it's in generally good condition. There was reportedly little central control over the wartime manufacturing of these flags, so there is wide variation in all its aspects. For example, the shades of color used, some appear to have even had a white bottom half, the thickness and types of cloth used, the types and orientation of the star, and even its overall shape and mode of attachment. Not much is known about the origin or history of this specific flag other than it was collected during the Vietnam War by a Coast Guardsman. He was aboard the cutter Point Jefferson, and the flag was reportedly taken in 1968 from a Vietnamese junk in the vicinity of the Mekong Delta. It was donated to the collection by the same person in 2014. For the last flag on the tour, we present a flag challenge to NAVA's members. Transferred to the Coast Guard in 2011 by the U.S. Navy, this hand-painted eagle flag is a mystery object in the collection. Relatively small and only painted on one side, close observation of the flag reveals penciled design elements indicating the flag may, in fact, be unfinished. The design does show through somewhat to the reverse side of the flag due to the thin structure of the field, so the fabricator may have thought it unnecessary to paint the reverse. The eyes on the header are hand-whipped, and without wear marks, and damage to the blue bar at the fly appears to be from age and possible insect activity, vice actual use. The flag's overall good condition reveals few indications of being flown, so if it was used, it was likely for a very brief period. Its style and fabrication methods, as well as its component materials, point to a flag possibly made in the mid-19th century. No documented history arrived with the flag, with some conjecturing it was a quote-unquote deception flag used in inland waterways during the Civil War or by vessels operated by the Union Army. Some have proffered the idea it was a revenue cutter service jack, the small identifying flag usually flown at the bow. The revenue cutter service being a predecessor of the modern Coast Guard, the Navy thought it might be better served to add it to the Coast Guard's collection and thus the transfer. Initial research has shown these types of flags, even with a white field, were popular in the 1800s and used on many merchant vessels, both inland and on the open ocean. Could this flag have indeed been used during the Civil War as a deception flag by a vessel in Confederate service and then captured by the Union Navy? Or could it have been a flag aboard a merchant vessel attempting to dodge customs fees and captured by the Revenue Cutter Service? There are many possible scenarios and the Coast Guard's Curatorial Services members continue to investigate any leads. What say you, members of NAVA? That ends our inside look at the Coast Guard Exhibit Center, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Scott Price, the Coast Guard historian, for approving today's tour, and thank once more to Janet Pashuk for the quick look at the Coast Guard's Heritage Asset Collection and for giving us an in-depth look at a few of its historic flag holdings. As an endnote, any of the images used in today's virtual tour, not owned by the Coast Guard or the producer of this video, has been documented in the sources noted in the script. 